How you doing? How you doing? We were waiting on you to start the program. <laughs> oh, Roscoe, how you doing? Was the traffic bad? Did you have difficulties? This is my aunt and uncle. It's bad? It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. My name is Kendra Gashton. I'm the host of tonight's wonderful event, the celebration of the publishing of Armstrong Williams' new book, Reawakening Virtues. Uh, we're incredibly honored and excited to have Armstrong here in New York at Witchcraft, which is one of the new hot, fast, casual restaurants in New York City, founded by a very good friend of ours, Jeffrey Zorowski. Um, one of the reasons we're here tonight is because amongst the many things that Armstrong celebrates is entrepreneurship and capitalism, and Jeffrey and his partner, Cisha, are two of the great young entrepreneurs in New York City, and so we're very, very delighted to be here in this great venue on the east side of New York City. And we're very excited to be honoring Armstrong and the publishing of his third book, The Greatest of the Three He's Written. Uh, and, it's, and it's such an honor for me to be in New York, uh, which was once the, um, the capital of um, fi the financial capital of the world. Of course, that's now Washington, D.C., with all the bailouts and all the money that people could get for little or nothing on Washington, D.C. I had to get that plug in there. But anyhow, the book is really about reawakening virtues. And reawakening virtues to me are reawakening the things to me that make me the person who I am. The virtue of honesty, the virtue of friendship, the virtue of savings, the virtue of capitalism, the virtue of motherhood and fatherhood. But more importantly, realizing that you can accumulate all the wealth in the world, but unless you reawaken the things that really are long lasting, that builds a society where it's honesty and integrity, which is the bedrock of American society, showing compassion, helping those who are less fortunate. I think we can do that better than in anyone else. That's why Americans are the most giving and contribute more to charity and, and foundational uh, missions around the world more so than anyone else. And so it took me two years to write this book. It's a labor of love, but it's actually my reawakening, especially the virtue of the Sabbath, where I really find myself walking along with God again, getting to know myself, realizing what it really means to be created in His image and doing the things that is expected of us. Even though He gives us free will, we fall short, we don't do everything that we should do, we should always find it within ourselves to have moral striving. Because if you continue to strive to be good, the quality of your life today will be better than what it was yesterday. So I'm not so much interested in when I meet someone and how much money they have, how big a house they live in. I want to know, are you a good person? Are you making the society around you better? Because we realize that the hardest work we have to do in the world is working on oneself 24 hours a day. And when we work on ourselves 24 hours a day, the world around us ultimately improves and gets better. Congrats, yes. Armstrong. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> writing a book, no joke. Yeah. I'm okay. Sure. You're writing the next one already. I do know the next one. Well, That's yeah, true. it's even easier the No, no, time. this is my first book in 16 years. This is my third one. Oh, first okay. in 16 years. Okay. I only write it when I have something to say, but there were two books I was, I was really torn between. And this was the toughest of the two. The next okay. one won't be difficult. Yeah. No, not at all. It took yeah. two years to write this book. Why? Because it's non-political. Um, it has nothing to do with politics. Okay. It has to do with virtues. It yeah. really does. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And how you reawaken them. Okay. <laughs> Good. Now, Bill Dacko and I go back 20 years. At Bill Dacko yeah, yeah, was a campaign manager for um, Steve Forbes. You know, and we supported Steve Forbes when yes, he ran for president. Yes, Wait, we you did. Helped staff the campaign. Yes, and that's Kendrick, how we got Kendrick. Kendrick. That's how I got Kendrick. That's exactly right. So, Bill, what, is, what do virtues mean to you? It's not political. How important are virtues to you? Living your life the right way. Living your right, the right way or the righteous way. Same thing. <laughs> The same thing, the same thing. So Bill, what do you do with yourself now? All corporate work. All corporate work. You enjoy no it? Candidates, no absolutely. candidate. Finish with politics. Yes. Unless the right candidate comes Unless along. Unless the right candidate comes on. Jeb Bush suddenly emerged again. Jeb Bush, yes. okay, yes. okay. You cannot not come to New York and not talk politics. This is true. Yes, you cannot. You have to talk a little politics. That's just the way it is. So you having fun? I am having fun. I'm just happy the flat. book's out. Oh my goodness. Yes. Happy the book's out. Happy to, ecstatic that the book is out. <laughs> Comptroller, you're running for the U.S. Senate? Yes, uh, I'm George Maragos, the Nassau County Comptroller, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate in 2012 against Julie Brandt. 
And, and how I, do you guys know each other? Pretty well, well, I expect your support. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't know how politicians. He's become my dear friend. <laughs> Are all of us best friends once they meet us? Absolutely. Yeah. How'd you guys meet? We met here. <laughs> yes. Yes, and the, uh, the, the mayor from Hempstead uh, just introduced us. Yes, this is the mayor from okay. Hempstead. Yes. Jim, well, come man, on in. It seems like he's been the mayor of Hempstead forever. <laughs> yeah. okay. 16 years is forever 16 in years. politics. Yes, it is well in politics. Yeah, yeah, Wonderful. Good. Thank you. Good luck. Yes, this is WVBA. Right. You've been a real stand-up guy. Looking forward to hearing oh, about the, about I've, the I've, got, I've got the bruises to show for it. You've been a real stand-up guy for the, for the conservative <laughs> politics. You've been a real stand-up guy. I'm not kidding you. Yeah, it seems, it seems ancient, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. You've, been at, you've been at it for a long time, though. A long, long time. A long time. You've been at it a long time. I started when I was a baby, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to tell you something, you took the heat over there. Oh, yeah. so most people write a book because they want yeah. to run for something. Yeah, so what are you going to well, run No, for? no, no. I'm not writing a book. I, got a, I have something to say. How do you want me to sign yours, my man? Well, like you met me years ago, Mayor. <laughs> to the Mayor. <laughs> I'm going to just say Mr. Mayor. Yeah, like you did many years ago. Now, Mike Lewis worked for me. How many years ago, Mike? My, he used to work for me in Washington, D.C. What was it like when you worked with me in Washington? Oh. Tell me what you never, wanted, you never said. Tell me, what was it like? Oh, boy. Um, you know, it was busy. Busy? We were busy. We this traveled is, a lot. This is when we, you were first taking off. Yeah, right that's true. first took off. That's exactly right. And uh, was it so unknown? It was unknown. You just started radio. And uh, it was just an exciting time. Yes. It was a great time for us. Very exciting. So I'll never forget it. And where we, uh, you were there with my first book. Yes. Beyond Bland. Mike was there with the first yes. guy. He I has a signed copy, so I'm looking hey, forward to uh, it. I'm going to sign. Oh, copy? absolutely. Right, it's a, a right. personal message right, to you. All right, all right. All right. So, Mr. Uh, Mr. Knock, we introduce yourself. This is WVVA. Take care of our television show in New York. These are very successful entrepreneurs in New York. Very dear friends of mine. I've stayed at their home. They come in from what part of um, Princeton, New Jersey. Right. Attend right. this book party. Just talk about um, the, what virtues mean to you. What virtues mean to me? Yeah. Well, virtues are universally some phenomenal things that everybody should have. Uh, that my friend Army has an abundance of. And uh, that's the reason why I think he has the kind of friends that he can really boast of. He has the virtues of friendship, he has the virtues of integrity, being really personable. And uh, those virtues is what I really love about us. Oh, <laughs> we're family here. We're a family. Really we We've family. known each other, listen, almost 15 years. A long time. We met in at the Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles, California. It's a very long time, um, very long. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm honored to be, have been invited at this uh, book ceremony. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Best co-host a man could have. But what you did with your book, Reawakening Virtues, what was the, what was the genesis behind this book? Why now Reawakening Virtues? Well, it started with um, No Child Left Behind, but I had been thinking about the book before then. Um, I've always, even when I wrote Beyond Blame and Letters to a Young Victim, I've always wanted to write a book about virtues and values. Uh, because one of the things that has always happened to me, especially being a Republican, is that a third generation Republican, especially in the minority community, you're always challenged about your belief system. And my attitude is, well, you know what? My belief system works for me. I have a lot of success as a result of my belief system. Now obviously, because you know, even if you take, um, you ask yourself this question, why is it that um, uh, Muslims and Jews are so successful in the world? You ask that question, they're very successful in the world. While Jews may embrace liberalism because they believe in sort of like socialism and giving back, they never embrace the values and the virtues of liberalism. They keep their own virtues and values in place, like keeping the household together, the value of education, not taking handouts from the government, self-worth by real self-esteem. And so, particularly if you look at the 1960s, before the 1960s, particularly in American black households, most black families, 85% of them had a mother and a father in the household. You did not have the indolence. 
um, you did not have the social pathologies that exist today. So what happened when the government said, well, if you accept our money, you cannot have a father in the household. You probably don't remember during the 70s when a government worker would come out looking under the bed, looking in the bathroom to see any sign of a man. That's right. So what they were able to do, they sacrificed the paycheck for the breakdown of a family. And who in their right mind, why would the government or anyone to have the abandonment of a father in the household, because that's the backbone of any household. So they totally abandoned their value system and their virtues. And so my attitude is the reason why people are successful is not because they're Jewish, not because they're Muslim, it's because the virtues that they believe in, the virtues of hard work, uh, the virtues of sacrificing, the virtues of savings, um, the virtues of capitalism. And when you got to get back, you, the government cannot define and grow your success. That is something that you have to do through hard work and through sacrifice. The Bible tells us a man must work by the sweat of their brow. If you don't work, you don't eat. Another problem is that everybody does not pull their weight in the economy. 47% of the people don't pay taxes. Let's just say if the poorest of the poor cannot pay the taxes that I pay, they should pay something. Everybody should have skin in the game because everybody will participate in our system of democracy. So yeah, so I wanted to write about this, this thing called virtues because if you have virtues in place that you pass on to your children, because you can pass on all the wealth to your children, but if they don't have virtues, they don't have a value system. They have no respect for that money. They have no appreciation for it, and it was squandered. No, no different than the lottery winner. Why is it that the lottery winner always goes in the financial worst financial uh, yeah. calamity? It's because they did not earn it. They don't respect it. You can only respect and basically keep what you earn. It's the only way you can grow it. So I wanted to write this book, Real Wicked and Those Virtues. Mike. I'm strong, you're too kind. I wasn't expecting this. Imar, Imar, he carries all his money in here. <laughs> That's why he holds on to it so tight. Hold on to it. Right, hold on to it. working on this book? Two years. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, two years. Can you believe that? I can't. That's a long time for me. I can't believe it. See, I do my own writing. So, it's a little different. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike it. Unlike, oh, a lot of people don't write their books. Trust me, okay? I know. Oh, yeah, you do know. Yeah, but I have to write mine, okay? And this is the kind of book that nobody else could write for you anyhow. I had editors just at work. I had a liberal editor. I wanted a liberal editor. Real? Yeah. You have another liberal friend? You cheated editor. on me? Editor. Editor. No, I, have a liberal, I had a liberal editor. Oh, yeah. Now, are these apartment buildings here? I you know what? I, I, I have to say, as long as I've been in New York, I, I, I've, I've never been, been over all here. over Manhattan. <laughs> And I came over here and I was like, I've never been over to I've never been over I, here. I came down here and I, this entire building is all new. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, you're yeah. kidding me. And I've actually been on that block where the NYU Medical Center is. But this, this is like a little oasis over here. Yeah. So it's a new development. This is all so, new. This is all new. Congratulations, by the way. Writing a book is a tough thing, right? It's tough. Especially this book. Yeah. This book's very tough. Is this your first or? No. He who is first shall be last. <laughs> no, it's not my first. No, it's not my first. It's the first book in 16 years, though. Oh, wow. Yeah. First book in 16 years. You're in fighting shape to do that, right? Man, let me tell you. You have no idea what it's taken to write this book. Yeah. And actually, with the publisher, with the editor, I wasn't sure that it would be published because I, I needed a liberal editor. Because I needed to be challenged in my conservative views. I really needed to be stretched. Uh -huh. And so we fought for three or four months. <laughs> Mercilessly. Right. We fought. Who won? Uh, he did. Because oh, yeah. he was right in the end. It's so hard when you've invested so much in your ideology that when you see a higher truth, the fact that you know you should abandon it because you know this is a greater truth. Absolutely. That's the hardest thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's right. No sacred cows. No sacred cows. That's, that's, that's right. right. And that's the thing about Obama. Everybody sure just right. fundamentally has no idea what he's doing. <laughs> But you know what, one of the things I dealt with in my book is the virtue of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Getting back to church, something I had gotten away with, but I got back to the Sabbath. And boy, what a blessing. You gotta spend time alone with God. Yes. You got to do it. Because, and I, I'm gonna probably talk about this, you know, you don't realize when you get away from the materialism and all the other things that just controls your attention, you get along with God and you regulate your virtue, 
you really begin to see the incredible creation mm -hmm. of his mm -hmm. and what it means you're created in his image and what that really means and it instructs you to restrain yourself, to restrict yourself, that you want to be good. You know, and it's a simple thing. You want to be good. You know, and, you know, it may sound like a lot. And I, you know, I said when I was writing, I said, you know, I really want to be good. And you can always be, it's never good enough. You can always be better. And so the reawakening virtue was reawakening my own virtues within myself. And it was just, was wonderful. I became a completely different person. My feelings, my thinking, the way I look. When people talk about you being cleansed, you cannot do that. And see, we're so busy trying to work on somebody else. But the hardest work you do in life is on yourself. That's the hardest work. And what I found interesting, the more I worked on myself, the more the world improved around me. <laughs> Amazingly, right? <laughs> Change your perspective. Yes, yes. Yes, oh. Oh, yes, so, so. And that's a beautiful thing. It really is. It's a beautiful thing. So yeah, the book, it's nothing political. Because there's nothing political about God. It's either right or unrighteous. That's all he cares about. Nope, no gray area. And so that's what I got back to. And it reawakened the things I used to feel as a child in the church. Things like that. Yeah, so it was good. It was a good experience for me. Very good exercise. And the reaction has been incredible from all sides. Yeah, so, but I could feel, you know, sometimes when you're doing something, you can realize that it's not you. You know how you say, just let yourself go and let God use you? And because, you know, we've become so political correct, you don't even talk about God. You don't even you gotta say, gee, you know, you got to say, Jesus, you know? <laughs> so nobody can really make out what you're saying. And so, you know, but now I can just say it. Yeah, so it's a good thing to understand what matters in life when it's all said and done. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I got back down to the roots. So what do you say about the fathers? It's oh, it's in there. Oh, you got to. Uh, well, you know the good news about it. Kendrick, the host, has underwritten all the books. So okay. we're giving all the books away to them. But we really dealt with the fathers. Oh yeah, that's a that's an important chapter. And the mothers. Okay. And the mothers. Yes, sir. And the mothers. Yes, 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 yes. And then I go back and read it. And then I'm amazed. I said, oh my God, I said, I had to say it because I wrote it. <laughs> because sometimes you can get so caught up in your faith and the spirit that it just comes. Do you know my name, sir? A-L-I-A. <laughs> I thank uh, all of you all for being here tonight to celebrate the publishing of Armstrong Williams' third baby, uh, Re Reawakening Virtues. Um, I'm quite honored to be the host of this event. Uh, you guys know Armstrong uh, from all his public exploits, uh, the syndicated column, the media personality, uh, the engagement in a public discourse that's, uh, that's uh, vigorous and uh, substantive. Uh, but he's been more than just a public personality for my wife and I and our family. He's been a dear friend and mentor for nearly 15 years and uh, has invested in me and my wife in ways that we'll never be able to repay. Um, and so we're deeply grateful for his friendship. Uh, we went through some really tough times last year, uh, both with the death of my father and the, the early birth of our twins, Duke Ashton, Kendrick Ashton III, we call him Duke, and Dylan Claudia Ashton, our daughter. And no one was more solid for us during those really tough periods than Armstrong. He's been there for us during the ups, uh, getting me some very, very important internships very early in my career and always advancing the cause of the Ashtons and during the downs last year. Uh, and we've come through it wonderfully as a consequence of, of his great friendship and the friendship of others here tonight. And so I'm just honored, uh, I'm proud of Armstrong. And uh, before I turn it over to him, I just want to say thank you for all you do. Uh, so welcome. Thank you guys for coming. really thank Kendrick and Mache um, for this book party. I mean, uh, Mache and Kendrick and I have known each other so long, and we've had many battles together. And I'll never forget when their son and daughter were in the um, John Hopkins University Hospital. I had never witnessed uh, a child in an incubator. It was so frightening 
because literally, and just to see, uh, I visited them recently, and just to see just how far the children have come is just really miraculous. And they have twins, and to see God bring them through and see how their faith has increased. Because, you know, if you really want to find out about your faith, let your child just lie, lay there helpless, and there's nothing you can do. You really find out what you got to, you got to stretch out beyond yourself, because there's nothing like a, child, a parent fighting for to survive that child. I was just glad to be a part of that. I want to thank you for um, thank you. really hosting this um, book party. Let's give Kendrick a round of applause. I, I just got to tell you about Reawakening Virtues because it's unlike anything I've ever done in my life, anything I've ever attempted, anything I ever thought was possible, really, in writing that book. Because I wanted to write a book um, about virtues. Uh, I wanted to write a book about values. You know, you always hear people talk about the poor, the downtrodden, why some people are more successful than others, why people struggle more than others. But you know, I was blessed growing up because I had a mother and a father. They were the best department of health and education and welfare that a household could ever have. And I'm thankful. And, and, and having a father today, Kendrick, is considered a luxury. It's a sad statement, but it's true. But I went through um, what would, I guess you would consider it to be a crisis, no child left behind. Because you know, when you're in the public eye, either you're in a storm, coming out of a storm, or going into a storm in life. Sometimes that's just the way life is, and your life will test you. But I went through no child left behind. We lost 80% of our business. Um, I got no more calls about media appearances. Um, people even said that I would become a footnote, that my name would never be mentioned again. And when I initially thought about writing a book and was shopping the manuscript, nobody was interested. I was so toxic. It was unbelievable. But the most, what was funny about that period was that my friends never abandoned me. They were always there. You know how you say you find out who your friends are, Mr. Nakvi? Well, you know what? I didn't have to find out who my friends are because they were really there. And so I decided now was the time to write, write the book. You know, I used to be known, if you ever watched me on television, I love the rail against about morality and virtues and you can go to hell in a handbag. I was the preacher on morals and moral absolutes. But let me tell you this. My own house was not in order. Okay, it's so easy to take the moat out of someone else's house. It's so easy to criticize somebody else and never have to look at yourself. But you know, when I went through my valley experience, you know, it's easy to blame people. But you know what? I accepted responsibility. I said, you know what? This is a teachable moment for me. Um, maybe something greater in life is trying to tell me when something. When I was growing up as a child, um, we had to go to church. And one of the things that were constant that my parents were obsessed with, and my father's deceased now, my parents always talked about going to this place called heaven. Now, you know, to some, it's, a, it's an imaginative place. It's a place that to some it does not exist. But let me tell you something. If you grew up in the South and you grew up in church, you believe in this place. You've heard of this place called heaven, haven't you? Have any of you not heard of this place called heaven? And I'll never forget at my father's funeral when he died, uh, Ali, uh, I remember the preacher said, well, you see him in heaven again. You know, everybody hears about heaven when death is around us. Everybody hears about heaven. And I'll never forget that. And I said, well, you know what? The thing about getting to this place called heaven, you got to be good. You got to be honest. You got to try to at least live and carry out God's commandments. And so I said to myself, we talk so much about having wealth in society, having fine homes in society, but we never really talk about wanting to be good. And towards the end of my book, the conclusion that I really came to, I just want to be good again. I want to be godly. I want to be fair. I want to be kind. I want to be compassionate. And I want to give. And just, if I'm a betting man, and I do take a lot of risk in the market, you know what? I decided I'm not betting against God anymore. Because you know what? My best shot, because you know, they told me when I was growing up, they said, this place called heaven, they said, there's no more sickness, no more sorrow. No more pain, Michelle, no more suffering. And they said, I see my father again. Now, when we lay our parents to rest, one of the things that gives us comfort is the possibility that we can see them again. Doesn't that give you comfort? Just the possibility. But just, just say that I put my bet with God 
And that is true. So you cannot lose doing good. You cannot lose doing right. Imagine if everybody in this country, in the world, did not have sex until they were married. Imagine that. Imagine no one had sex outside of marriage, and everybody were faithful to their wives. Imagine that. Imagine the kind of world that we would have. I'm talking about virtues. We're talking about virtues now, but imagine if we return to a virtuous life. At least try. Imagine the solve problems that would be resolved in our nation. Just imagine that. Imagine what would go away. The sexually transmitted diseases. The AIDS. Imagine all this that would go away. Just imagine it. So what we can start here in this room is reawakening our own virtues. And just maybe if you reawake your own virtues and you get in touch with that creator again, because I'm in touch with it, because I'm feeling it. I don't know if you feel it. If you feed it off me, I'm feeling it, because I'm good. I'm happy tonight. And it's not because of my book. It's because I've reawakened what's most important in me, and that is trying to do good, trying to serve God, even though I fall short time and time again. At least if I keep reaching for that which is good, at least the quality of my life will be better today than it was yesterday. What we got to do is from someone who's weary and cannot find their way, we got to keep the light of virtue in that window. So you can ease the pain that life can bring. Find the peace that that spirit brings. Because we all have been chosen for a work to do. And through a reawakening virtues, we must build a better world for me and for you. Thank you very much. Looks like a wrap. It was a great event, Armstrong. Uh, I met some of the most wonderful people. I thought all the good people were in the South. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are, but we brought them up for the you event. You brought them up. Yes. And what your friends had to say about you was just only reinforces what I already know. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I'm a lucky man to have you in my life, and I'm, I'm very honored that you asked me to do this. And I think it was a huge, huge success. It was. Are you ready to start reawakening some virtues? I am. I am. How do you? How will you start? Uh, that's a good question. It's a tough question, uh, but I'm going to start by rereading your book. Rereading it. Rereading your book. Why don't you start by reading it? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. 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 That's that's where you start. Andy. I right, read it because I know you're busy. Um, are you sometimes surprised when you think about from which you come? Of, you know your father's some of some of your success, not where you are now. Is it really, do you have to pinch yourself sometimes? Is, really, is this really my life? No, you know, I, I, uh, I, I've, I've been enormously lucky to have a family that told me that I was special from the day I, I can remember uh, even having family members. And so uh, I've got this sort of inbred sense uh, of destiny, and uh, it really it, it's given me the psychological armor to go out in the world and, and, and try to stake a claim. So, uh, I, 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 it's, 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 uh, it's flattering that people think I should pinch myself, but lucky for me, you know, my family sort of gave me an outsized ego early on uh, that, that's helped me really be successful, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. You know, we want to thank um, the WVVH audience for joining us in the celebration of my first book in 16 years, Reawakening Virtues. What you must do is not worry about reawakening virtues in someone else, reawaken them in yourself, get back to the essence of who you are, uh, start observing the Sabbath again, start building your relationships, especially with your family, especially with your parents, because they're not with you long. If you're blessed enough to have a mother and father, make sure you try to communicate with them every day. Reawaken those virtues and you realize that the world around you will rapidly improve.